All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our third session of the Career Pathways in Youth and Young Adult Mental Health. Uh, today, we will be talking about researchers and evaluators. Uh, and um, we, have, we have had two other sessions. So far, we have explored roles of peers uh, and social workers, and we will also be talking with mental health clinicians in July. Um, just as a disclaimer for our session today, um, this is uh, represented views of all of our panelists and uh, facilitators this afternoon. Um, this session is not representative of SAMHSA's views, um, and so we'd like everyone to know that. Next slide. If for any reason today our session is interrupted, um, for any reason, uh, we will end the session automatically and you will receive a new link to join um, by the email that you had registered. Um, so welcome again. I am Victoria Eckert. Um, this is our agenda for the day. Uh, we will tell you a little bit about NTAC, the National Training and Technical Assistance Center, who we are and what we do. Um, we'll also have an opportunity to meet our wonderful um, expert presenters today representing researcher and evaluator roles. Uh, we will talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the career pathways for both of those roles. You know, how do you get there? How do you learn more about evaluation and research um, and, and uh, other resources in the field? Um, we will also then uh, end our PowerPoint and we'll have a nice uh, panel discussion with our, our panelists today. And then there'll be an opportunity for questions and then we'll give some information on next steps for the series and resources going forward. Um, again, I am Victoria Eckert. Uh, I am uh, with Youth Move National as Operations Director. I use she, her pronouns. I'm also part of two teams under UNTAC, the National Training and Technical Assistance Center. I'm a uh, part of the Youth and Young Adult Transformation Team and the Partnerships for Systems Transformation Team. So a little bit about NTAC, um, if, if you don't know, or if you haven't heard of us, or this is your first time at one of our events, um, we wanted to make sure that everyone on the call has an overview of our multi multidisciplinary team and what we do. Um, as you can see here, our multidisciplinary team is made up of uh, wonderful national experts um, around the country. We have the uh, Center for Applied Research Solution, CARS. We have uh, Georgetown University, Change Matrix, the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, Georgetown University Hospital, um, the University of Texas at Austin, Fredla, the Family Run Executive Director Leadership Association, and Youth Move National. As I had mentioned before, uh, the two transformation teams that I am a part of, um, those aren't the only transformation teams through NTAC. Um, we have teams that focus on different areas of the field transformation. So we are looking at school-based services, infant and early childhood, the Partnership for Systems Transformation, youth and young adults of transition age, and the community wellness and peer supports team. Our goal through the National Training and Technical Assistance Center as a team, we would like all children, youth, young adults, and families with emotional or behavioral health needs can access evidence-based treatment and recovery services in a well-coordinated system of care. Who we serve is, as you can see here on this list, is a robust representative across communities. Um, some example, examples of our key cross-sector audiences include state and local agency leaders, the mental health workforce, such as clinicians, social workers, home visitors, peers, primary care providers, school workforce, community-based providers, peer supervisors, and youth and family partners. Our services, uh, as you can see here on this wonderful graphic, um, they are no cost, um, typically centered around training and technical assistance and other resources as well. But as you can see here, these are um, often individualized for community um, or needs in the field. So just like today, we're here for this uh, webinar uh, and series. Um, we offer many of those throughout all of our transformation teams. Um, sometimes it looks as if um, communities might need individual consultation. Uh, we will drop links in for all of you 
you if you are looking for no cost uh, technical assistance needs um, and how to request that. Um, sometimes our offerings are peer learning exchanges, customized coaching, and you can see here communities of practice. Um, we also have some written materials, not only on our website, but through email listservs, such as Five Things Digests, which are short um, snippets of information for the field, along with resources. Um, podcasts, other tools, and much, much more. So why are we here today? Why are we here for these series? Um, as we had mentioned before, this is the third of four series. So again, we are examining and exploring uh, research and evaluator ro roles. Um, but we know that careers in the helping field are broad. Um, I, I am a social worker myself, and, uh, you know, I I had thought I wanted to help children, help families when I was younger. I had a view of what social workers were to me um, when I was a young person, you know, trying to figure out what my career was when I was in high school. And uh, I thought, you know, helping people, um, you know, going into this work, maybe it was a teacher and, you know, learning more about myself over time and, and what was available to me and what fit my strengths and my skill sets is how I figured out that social work was for me. Um, and we know that a lot of young people today um, may not have access to good resources to give them really the, the wonderful information about the, the broad array of careers in the mental health, um, behavioral health, or helping field. Um, we wanted to offer a space for youth and young adults and other supportive adults in their lives to hear perspectives of those in the field. Um, I know as a young person, when I spoke with people who were social workers for years and years, uh, it was inspiring to me. It was people that I looked up to, people that I hoped someday I could have that kind of knowledge about the field, um, it, the information, and hearing from people that are actually doing the work versus just kind of thinking about this career as, as, as you know, kind of out of touch. Um, sometimes it can be um, really impactful to the possibilities that are open to us as, as young people. Um, also really important to mention Generation Next here. And um, as far as Generation Next, this is a concept that was developed by Youth Move and National, the organization that I work for. Um, this demonstrates that in order to sustain any youth movement, as youth advocates transition to advocates for youth, so as they age, um, it is essential that the next generation of young people who will become youth advocates are continuously engaged. So are we passing on um, good, solid, reliable information to young people to make informed decisions and choices about their future? Um, so hopefully today um, that can provide some insight to many of you on the call. And we can learn from one another and recognize that there's not one size fits all pathway. You know, not every, um, you know, uh, uh, helping field or behavioral health um, position or role or job requires you to go to school formally or requires a certain degree or training pathway. Um, and we hope that we can highlight all of the different pathways in which many of us got into the field and into these roles um, that really show that um, it's unique to all of us. And yes, sometimes there is a, a specific schooling or training needed, but not always. So we had surveyed all of our panelists today, which you'll meet here shortly, and we had asked them from their perspective is what are the strengths of researchers and evaluators? Um, as you can see here on the slide, there's there's quite a few of them, right? Uh, so uh, an understanding of qualitative and quantitative data resources. So yes, are we looking at numbers that we're gathering through research and evaluation? Or, but are we also listening to people's stories, their anecdotal perspective? Um, you know, what are they feeling? What have they experienced? So it's you know, and, and I'm going to let our, our panelists talk about this later, but um, 
research and evaluation is not always numbers. We had talked about this in our prep. It's not always doing math, but it's also listening to stories and perspectives and histories of people and, and what they've, they've experienced in their lives. Um, we also know that researchers and evaluators should have good um, listening and communication skills, um, and, and I would assume also patience, um, and an ability to translate findings. So taking what we've learned through those um, numbers and through those stories and making sense of them to people that either influence funding, influence policy, um, influence decision making. So, so there's a bit of a storytelling component there as well. Um, attentive to small details and the big picture, um, critical and innovative thinkers, um, and, and researchers and evaluators are also people that have a desire to ask sometimes tough questions, right? Um, you know, a lot of times research and evaluation comes from um, under an understanding of maybe we're not um, being as efficient or effective as we could be in what we are doing. And so asking those tough questions um, to people who are doing the work and who are funding the work um, can be really powerful, but sometimes tricky. Um, we also want to understand the intersection between micro, meso, and macro levels of practice. And really what that means is um, uh, knowing that uh, when we work one-on-one -on -one with someone or in groups, or if it's large systems, they all um, have influence on the other. Um, we also want to be a forever learner, and I feel like this is uh, true for any, any profession that we're talking about and as just humans in general, um, you know, just coming to the table knowing that there's always something new coming out. There's always further research. There's further knowledge, um, especially uh, learning from others that have been doing this work uh, for a long time uh, can really be powerful or just hearing other perspectives as well. I'm coming to the table with a curious mindset. So again, coming with um, questions and curiosities, um, having strong collaboration skills. And, um, you know, as we do systems change work, uh, you know, just having um, a vision that, um, you know, kind of decreasing those barriers and those silos and, and working alongside others um, can be very, very powerful um, in this work and other roles as well. Of course, time management uh, and then discipline specific skills, which um, I know our panelists will talk about, you know, research and evaluation is pretty broad um, in its own self. So um, there'll be a slide just in shortly uh, to talk about what those uh, roles are. And through our surveying of our panelists, we have also learned um, the pathways to getting into either a research or an evaluator role. Um, as you can see here, as I had mentioned for myself in social work, having a good mentor to help along the way. So again, having a safe space to ask questions, to hear how oh, hard we got to get out of there, got into the field. Um, how, uh, you know, maybe some barriers, maybe some ways of uh, learning more information or finding resources. Um, so just finding a mentor that um, is a safe person to ask questions to. Um, oftentimes we had learned through our uh, panelists that um, at least an undergraduate degree, which is bachelor's of uh, four years, um, may be necessary to do this work. Not always, but necessary. And many also have a master's uh, or a doctorate degree. So some further advanced education. Um, sometimes um, we can also take specific classes or training. So if the field that you're trying to get into or the role that you're trying to obtain doesn't necessarily ask for a particular degree, um, there are various training pathways that we can also engage in. Um, so you can see here there's research methods, statistical analysis, learning specific programs or software to help you collect the data, make sense of it. Um, and then different programming languages. Um, also, of course, with, with most other helping fields as well, internships or even uh, finding a research assistant position um, at a college campus would be helpful as well. So again, learning from others, um, furthering our education. 
Um, on the job training as well, there are a lot of positions and opportunities out there that provide us the skills that we need to be effective in that role. Um, it might be uh, like culturally responsiveness, data collection, um, equity training, adopting a trauma-informed lens when we're collecting data. Um, and I'm sure our panelists probably have more suggestions on all of these. And then lastly, might have to pass the GRA, GRE, which is a graduate record examination. Um, it is a standardized examination, um, oftentimes to either get into a particular degree program um, or to show certain knowledge and certain skill sets. Um, I don't know a lot about that, um, but I'm sure um, our, our panelists probably do. We've also asked our panelists to tell us a little bit about the different roles um, and their titles in the field of research and evaluation. And I was actually quite surprised to learn that there are so many different um, possibilities of titles out there um, in research and evaluation roles. So a couple of highlights, um, and, and you all can see that, I'm sure there are many, many more that aren't included on this slide. Um, maybe they're a, a grant evaluator. So some of you joining the call today might be a, por a part of a system of care or a healthy transition community. Um, and you probably have a, a um, grant evaluator um, as part of your uh, grant team. We also uh, mentioned research assistant at a university. Um, maybe someone is a research scientist. Um, sometimes they're professors at university or colleges, um, sometimes teaching some of those specialized training courses that I had talked about, like research methods um, or other um, programming or software classes, uh, policy analyst, program evaluator, um, sometimes a trainer or a technical assistance provider. Um, maybe they could be a research fellow, um, and everyone uh, coming to the table is probably an advocate um, it, or for a policy or systems in some way. I would like to now pass uh, the mic on to Annie. Uh, Annie Stafford, who is a certified peer specialist, um, has been involved with the mental health systems, both personally both personally and professionally for over 10 years. Currently, she facilitates continuing education trainings for county mental health workers on various mental health topics, serves on various committees to propel systems change forward, and is co-founder and director of her own mental health nonprofit organization called Ten to Hope. Formerly, Annie has worked as a youth consultant on the National Council for Mental Wellbeing's Connected Project. Annie is committed to utilizing her, her lived experience to act as an advocate, educator, and support to young people navigating the mental health system. So please welcome Annie, um, and thank you all so much. We are going to just kind of have a facilitated discussion, hearing from each of our panelists about their unique careers in the fields of research. Um, and just really learn about everything that everybody's doing. And towards the end of the session, we're gonna leave about 10 minutes or so for questions to hear from everybody. And other than that, yeah, we're just gonna get rolling. For our panelists here, I am going to introduce everybody. And after I read through bios, it would just be great if um, each person could just say hello, share their preferred pronouns, just maybe something they're excited to get from the presentation today that they're hoping to convey during the panel. So first off is Dr. David McClung, who is a research associate with the Texas Institute for Excellence in Mental Health at the University of Texas at Austin. David is a nationally recognized expert in youth engagement and participatory models for community development. With over a decade of experience working in youth serving systems, David has been a key advisor and change agent in expanding youth peer support, youth driven initiatives and data driven decision making. In his free time, David enjoys spending time with friends and family, playing with the family dogs, reading, playing trivia and drinking coffee while having deep existential slash philosophical conversations. Love that, David. And if you wouldn't mind just saying hello. 
Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining. Uh, excited to be, to be able to talk with you. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, and again, I live in Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm just excited for us to be able to kind of talk about some of the opportunities I think there are for youth and young adults to be involved in research and the opportunity that means for being able to create the changes that I think we recognize are needed, uh, but maybe aren't sure necessarily how to approach sometimes. And next up, we have Rochelle Espiritu, PhD, who is a Filipina immigrant and research psychologist who centers equity in the training, technical assistance, and capacity building that she provides in the areas of behavioral health, evaluation, workforce development, systems change, and policy development. She is founding partner with Change Matrix, a minority and woman-owned small business that motivates, manages, and measures change to support communities and systems that improve lives. She currently le leads national, federal, and foundation initiatives, including the Pacific Southwest Mental Health Technical Transfer Center, Technology Transfer Center, the National Network to Eliminate Disparities in Behavioral Health, Transforming Academia for Equity and Expanding the Bench, which envisions a world where power is distributed equitably amongst evaluators, community members, and funders to lead change towards justice. Previously, Dr. Espiritu was a faculty member at Georgetown University and served as the Director of Evaluation for the GU Center for Child and Human Development. She is passionate about service leadership and community engagement. She serves on numerous boards, including the Colorado Children's Campaign, a nonpartisan advocacy organization committed to realizing every chance for every child in Colorado. She is a former school board member of Denver Public Schools, where she provided direction and leadership for whole child efforts and successfully passed a resolution for DPS to become a trauma-informed school district. In 2015, Dr. Espiritu was appointed by the mayor of Denver to the Denver Asian American Pacific Islander Commission and served as the chair from 2017 to 2018. She received her doctorate in clinical psychology from the University of Colorado at Boulder, where she was a Patricia Robert Harris Scholar. She lives in Denver, Colorado with her husband and has two sons, a DPS alumni and current student at Northfield High School. Great. Thanks, Amy. Darn, I should have sent you a shorter bio. Sorry, that was so long, but it's so nice to be here. Hi, everyone. My name is Rochelle Espiritu. My pronouns are she, her. And uh, I think what I'm most excited about sharing today is maybe an alternative pathway uh, to a career that you might have not thought of. I, I know that it wasn't an area that I thought I would land in, and so excited to share experiences and um, maybe open up a new pathway for, uh, for participants who are on the call today. Thanks, Annie. And next up is Pamela Trevidi, PhD and nationally certified school psychologist, who is a licensed psychologist, nationally certified school psychologist, <laughs> policy expert, and applied behavioral health researcher with more than two decades of experience supporting children of a range of ages and the providers and families who care for them. Pamela is a committed is committed to strengths-based, resilience-focused approaches and brings a national policy lens to her work in the build in building and sustaining mental health systems that are responsive to the behavioral health needs of children and families and the providers who serve them. Pamela is currently the team lead for NTAC's Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health Transformation Team conducts research on applied behavioral health and program evaluation, supports staff wellness as a school-based behavioral health professional and as a research associate professor of pediatrics at Georgetown University's Center for Child and Human Development. Pamela's longstanding research interest has centered on the unfolding of racial and ethnic identities across the lifespan. And most recently, she conducted research about the experiences of parents of children with special health care needs during the pandemic and ways states and communities are supporting an aligned approach to the infant and early childhood mental health continuum. Pamela continues to learn from parenting her six and nine-year-old children and lives with her family in Washington, D.C. 
All right, Pamela, please fill in the blanks where my dog got, got the brunt. Oh, there. that's okay. I, I'm glad your dog was doing that because I too should have sent a much shorter bio. So that was perfect listening to your dog. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, oh, my pronouns are she and her. And um, I'm also really excited and honored to be part of this panel. Um, I just listening to the bios of colleagues. I'm really um, excited to learn more from them and um, also to kind of demystify what constitutes research and how you could participate. Um, I think there, as, as Rochelle was mentioning, there, there are many pathways that you may not know about. So excited to talk that through with you all. And our last panelist here today is Eden Shabit, who is a graduate research assistant and final semester master's student at Tufts University School of Medicine, where she studies health informatics and analytics. Before graduate school, Eden was a youth served at Massachusetts Young Adult Access Center and later supported the Young Adult Access Center's evaluation work at UMass Chan Medical School. Eden is a member of the Research and Evaluation Subcommittee of the Youth Best Practice Committee at Youth Move National. Thanks, Annie. Uh, it's really nice to be here. My pronouns are she and they, either are fine. Um, and I think what I'm most excited to share today is the experience of a youth served into the research and eval world and how easy it is potentially to, uh, to find and identify adult mentors to walk you through that process. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. And I believe for this next slide here, um, Pamela is going to be kind enough to explain the importance here. Yeah, so thank, thank you so much, Annie. Um, so these are, um, as Victoria was mentioning in her wonderful introduction, kind of we discussed together, the panelists, sort of how research and evaluation can be important in systems change. I think all of us are, and lots of folks who have logged in today are really committed to just kind of changing systems and thinking through how our individual voices and experiment and, and experiences can contribute to that work of systems change. Um, I really like this first bullet that, um, you know, we, we heard Victoria say that um, when she was in high school, she wanted to be a social worker and focus on clinical work. And that is definitely one way to, to leverage um, lived experience, getting involved in direct support as a provider, but um, the, this research track that we're going to be talking about today is an important way to help others and uh, to be able to center um, the voices of, of folks with lived experiences. And that theme of centering the voices of uh, people with lived experiences, especially people um, for whom systems have been harmful um, and people who are kind of from underserved racial and ethnic groups, uh, I think a lot of us here on the panel, those are the folks that we really um, focus on in our research um, and ways that their experiences um, can contribute to kind of the decisions that policymakers and program, program planners are making. Um, and I think that for, from my own perspective, as somebody who does clinical work and research, um, being thinking of things from a, a research lens is a way to, I mean, I hear from a lot of individual voices in my clinical work and thinking things through um, as a researcher helps connect those individual voices um, and helps me think of ways to, when I hear a lot of themes across individual experiences, you know, and kind of engage in that work of translation in ways that um, are understandable to folks who make decisions, I mean, that it's a little bit of a difference from being a clinician and a researcher and a little bit more of the potential to contribute to system change, um, you know, in, in some of those kind of different lenses. Um, you know, we, I was just mentioning this before, we know that, um, we know that these systems are broken sometimes and doing harm um, and ways that we can contribute to that by figuring out how folks' stories, folks' heart stories, can contribute to systems change, working with research participants, um, you know, who are engaged in the process um, to figure out their contributions. Um, that's one of the kind of most joyful things about this work. Um, I think Rochelle is gonna talk about this next point in a much more <laughs> eloquent way than I can do, but 
just the idea that we have the power as researchers and evaluators to influence um, racial and social justice issues um, and kind of to do this work by thinking through questions that will get at, um, you know, what the social justice issues are, listening to voices um, that have experienced these different things in systems. And again, being able to translate that information back to people who make decisions. Um, so again, contributing to systems change. I think that another another small uh, piece of this work that I wanted to mention here, not a small piece, is just the opportunity to think through the different and diverse ways of knowing and how we collect data and trying to incorporate you know, more diverse ways of knowing into our data collection methods. We'll, we'll talk about this a little bit, that addition to the training that we've all received and that some of you have, may have started to receive uh, in quantitative methods or statistics, and then the complementary approaches of qualitative research and sort of how those different kinds of methodologies can work together to, um, you know, to inform system change or answer some important questions that we have, um, you know, about how to improve our services and supports for children and families with behavioral health care needs. So I'll go ahead, we're going to, we're going to dig into all of these topics. Um, Annie is going to help us dig into all of these topics. Um, but thanks a bunch for letting me uh, present this little summary here as a way to launch into our conversation. So yeah, thank you so much, everybody. It's great to learn a little bit about you. And I think the first question that I would just love to pose to everybody here is if everyone can just describe a little bit about the roles that they're currently in, um, just a little bit about what brought them there, the length of time in this position, just any job specific things that um, you might be willing to share with us and somebody might be willing to start. Okay, well, because I don't like silence, I will step in. Um, thank you for the question and the offer, Annie. I think that um, I've had an interesting pathway to research and evaluation. And as you heard from my bio, my, my degree is actually in clinical psychology and similar to Pamela, I think, you know, I, I went, I pursued my uh, undergraduate and graduate degree thinking that I was going to go into clinical services. And uh, along the way, I had a great mentor who did research on um, depression and light exposure, seasonal affective disorder. And so that was kind of my first exposure to research and, and was able to work with him on um, you know, some studies and gain some, some research skills, which was really an, an amazing experience for me as an undergraduate student. And so um, I fast forward, I am now um, an owner of a small business, a woman-owned minority-owned small business that does systems change work and does evaluation work as well, because I brought that skill set in as I had that experience, kind of on the job experience. And so never thought that I would um, be a business owner or be, you know, pursuing grants that do this kind of work. And I think what it showed me and what I've kind of reflected on is that getting my doctorate degree, um, regardless of focus area, gave me critical thinking skills that I've been able to use um, throughout my career that I've really been able to translate into different settings. And it's been an amazing opportunity where I think, you know, who knows where I'll go next. It just kind of feels like when you have that good grounding that you can kind of go into almost any area that you're interested in. And I've seen many people do that along the way that um, I, I feel like you should never feel like necessarily your, this is like your direction, but that it's always a pathway and you never know where you're going to end up and to enjoy it along the way. Um, so I've been only, I've owned Change Matrix and led it now for 15 years. Um, and it's um, brought me incredible um, challenges and opportunities along the way. So I'll just pause there, Annie, and invite one of my colleagues to, to jump in and share. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a final semester master student at Tufts. 
uh, where I've primarily studied methods in health information science and support research under faculty in the same. Um, and then before then, I was working in an evaluation-based role for the Young Adult Access Centers in Massachusetts through Systems of Care and Healthy Transitions, uh, where I was a youth served myself and became interested in what was going on and where the information about us was going and for what purpose and how it was contributing to the changes we were seeing um, on the ground there. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. And I will popcorn that over to uh, David. Thank you so much, Eden. Uh, so again, my name is David McClung. I currently work with the University of Texas at Austin. I've been with uh, UT for about seven years uh, officially, um, otherwise about nine years. Um, and so uh, UT has been great for me. Um, and you know, I, I like others, I don't know that I ever intended to go into a research or evaluation role. Um, I uh, was in college and I had an interest in research, but research seemed like this big, scary word that meant like you had to work in a real formal institution and couldn't talk real language or be authentic and had to kind of change yourself in order to uh, be really good at math um, and do these fancy things. Um, and I had the opportunity, um, fortunately, through the behavioral health agency that was there um, in uh, the city I went to college in. Um, to really be able to kind of begin doing interviews uh, with families as part of an evaluation. Um, and that led to some opportunities um, in college for me to be able to start kind of exploring, you know, what does this look like? And what I learned through that was uh, those stories were sacred. Um, and that those stories had not only the ability to be able to uh, change systems, but that they were uh, special, that there was something very, again, sacred, for lack of a better word, uh, when families and youth were willing to uh, sit down and share their stories and willing to be able to uh, provide data, um, which were in the form of those stories, um, to be able to uh, share what it was that was working, but also what wasn't working. Um, and uh, just the amount of trust that took uh, to be able to do that, um, even though often those systems and uh, services and other things hadn't necessarily worked for them. Um, and I, I just remember thinking, you know, if people are willing to share uh, this piece of their story and they're willing to take this amount of time, this amount of effort, uh, despite all the things that they've gone through, it's very, very important to me uh, that I'm able to hold those close and I'm able to protect those, but also that I'm able to ensure uh, that that information uh, doesn't just go to waste and doesn't just sit inside of some database somewhere um, never to be used, but that it has the ability to be used um, for the change that they trust it's going to be used for. Um, and so uh, since that time, I, I've had the privilege to work on quite an array of different projects. I currently serve as an evaluator and uh, primary investigator for um, what's called a CCBHC grant um, for one of our local communities. Um, and then also I'm fortunate to serve on the intact team uh, with our community wellness and peer support team uh, and occasionally our transition age youth team as well. Uh, and uh, last but certainly not least, uh, I'll turn it over to Pamela. Thanks, David. That, I mean, right, these are just inspired. It's inspiring to hear more about um, how our colleagues entered the field. I love, David, I love the idea of stories as sacred. I think Rochelle and I had a similar journey into this work. Um, I, I always knew I wanted to be a clinician um, and I, I sort of uh, entered into <laughs> training as a researcher uh, really was because of a topic um, that that I had always been fascinated about and that was deeply personal to me, which is sort of how racial identities unfold, racial and ethnic identities, and what that looks like for mixed race children. Um, so that's what I did my dissertation on. I, I was trained in methods from anthropology that kind of built on my uh, clinical skills that I was learning of listening deeply to folks, trying to understand lots of factors from the environment that could influence how somebody behaves and how their stories are formed, such as family influences, community influences, cultural influences. Um, so I had the chance to do that deep work um, early in my career as a researcher. And then for 10 kind of Throughout the middle of my career, I was a federal policymaker, which is kind of exactly the opposite of going deep <laughs> into individual stories and communities. It's a very eagle's eye view of how systems work. Um, 
And I, I think that was super, a super valuable perspective to me, to, for me to be kind of deeply immersed in um, because so the direction of my research now is really policy focused. And a lot of the research that I do involves um, interviewing um, state administrators ab about the services and supports offered to families. So it's kind of different from where I started as a researcher, but kind of, you know, what, whatever I learned as a federal policymaker about how to change systems kind of deeply informs the, the type of research and the kinds of topics that I'm involved with now. And I, you know, I still get a little bit of that need for <laughs> hearing stories deeply and contextually over time by doing a little bit of clinical work. Just one day a week, I do clinical work and the rest of the week I'm involved in this applied research and policy work. So I work at Georgetown University in the Department of Pediatrics, as Annie mentioned, and one of the projects I'm lucky to be involved with is NTAC. For the next question, I definitely heard a few of you touch on it, some personal experiences that might have led you to the position you're in now. But yeah, just for anybody who might not have, I'm wondering if there was any specifics of your own life journey or maybe a loved one or anything that that drove you to this position specifically and the kind of work that you're doing within your position? Or if not, I also wonder if your geographical location, how that plays a role in your work, if you find it a barrier, if you find that it makes things easier for you, or just generally speaking, how that could affect someone who might be looking to go into this as a career. So I had mentioned that I was a youth served at a young adult access center. And then briefly after that, I had worked in a peer specialist role. I was a CPS um, at a young adult access center and also at a community based organization. And I had became I'd become very interested in the ongoing conversations and dialogues and discussions happening within the broader field about documentation practices and ethical documentation practices and data justice practices. And this led to my involvement with the evaluation team on the peer side and then leading to a role at UMass on the evaluation team where I got to work with some of the cool software and learn some cool programming languages. And that's when I became interested in computer science. So it was a very um, sequential kind of process for me that started in one place that I hadn't expected would end up somewhere completely different. Um, and that's how I ended up deciding to go to graduate school and study information science, which was kind of the best of both worlds, having the health sciences piece, understanding the systems perspectives and uh, how people's individual experiences are so key and crucial, but then also the technical computer science side. So kind of the best of both worlds there. I can popcorn it if folks would like. So I would say, you know, Change Matrix has actually been a virtual company for 15 years. So geography actually doesn't really impact my work, which I've appreciated um, along the way is being able to continue the work that I'm passionate about, regardless of where I am. Uh, I'd say that part of the pathway for me was one recognizing that um, as, as a woman of color, that the field of evaluation and research is very much dominated historically by white men and maybe even more now white women. Uh, and so to me, it was really important to ensure that, that different voices and perspectives were represented in, in the field. And so right now I direct an initiative called Expanding the Bench, which is about kind of shifting power and making sure that evaluators of color, researchers of color are in the field so that their perspectives and lived experiences are, are represented and that they direct um, the way questions are asked, what is considered data, because oftentimes we think about data as numbers um, and surveys, and yet we know that historically in many of our communities, it's the stories, you know, David mentioned that earlier. Um, and, and it's those narratives that don't get told. And so for me, it was really important to ensure a lens of equity in this work that often isn't represented um, because power has been taken away from communities of color and underserved communities um, for so many years and decades. and. And you know, harmful data extraction has happened historically where communities of color 
are researched or evaluated and the data is not given back to them and they're not able to use that data to support the kind of change for equity and justice that they need. And so, you know, the stories become the stories of the researchers or the evaluators rather than the stories of the communities. And I feel like those voices are so important for us to move the needle and to address the systemic racism that exists in so many of our systems. And so for me, that was a real driving factor as I've looked around my field and even looked around who my other graduate um, student colleagues were um, to note that that, that that continues. And so I feel really passionate about encouraging young people um, to, to share their lived experience and to make sure that they know that their voices and their experiences really matter. Really wonderful to hear some more about these motivations and sort of how, um, how kind of your, how folks' position in Eden's case as, a, as somebody who had been, um, you know, received behavioral health services and Michelle, your um, position as a woman of color really have influenced your, your professional journeys here. Um, I think my story is similar, just on a kind of more personal note. Um, when I needed behavioral health services as a adolescent um, and, a, and a young person, I was taken to, you know, white psychiatrists, white social workers. I didn't feel I didn't feel connected to them. I didn't feel like we were what I would now call building a good therapeutic alliance. And it just has always made me think, what if there was more um, congruence between, you know, either providers or people making decisions and the people for whom the decisions are made. So kind of similar to um, some of the themes that um, Rochelle was mentioning. So at the beginning of my, um, at the beginning of my career, I did some master's level work as a school psychologist before I went back to school to get a PhD. And, um, you know, I also felt like even as a person of color, there was so many problematic things and systems that I was contributing to um, that were doing harm to kids. Um, so kind of, I, I was, for example, um, intelligence testing and the way tests are biased and the way high stakes decisions are made about that. So these are all the reasons I wanted to go back and um, kind of be on the research side of things or be on more of the decision making side of things from that early clinical work. Um, later in my career, both as a federal policy maker and a researcher, I've been able to um, contribute um, in, in, in ways that have been really personally meaningful to me on to, to topic to research and policy topics such as um, preschool expulsion and especially kind of why uh, little kids of color are the ones who are kicked out of preschool. I mean, it sounds like for, for somebody who doesn't really know about early childhood, that sounds like something that doesn't even make sense, but that um, there's such a disparity for especially um, African-American boys of, you know, getting disconnected from the services and supports that could really make a difference in their trajectories. So, um, you know, I was able to, I was maybe contributing to systems that were doing harm as an early clinician. And then I was able to kind of leverage that knowledge and, um, you know, contribute to kind of dismantling um, some of those harmful approaches as a researcher and a policymaker. I, I approach it from a slightly different perspective, I think, as a, a white cisgender uh, hetero male. Um, and I, I think, you know, I, I've had the privilege of getting to be in places um, and to sit at tables that uh, friends and family and others haven't always been able to uh, because of uh, their identities. Um, and the result of that has often been that those systems have harmed uh, those friends and families in some pretty significant ways, um, including loss of life. Um, and, and so, um, you know, that to me, the, those stories, along with my own personal lived experience, really kind of serve as motivation um, for being able to find ways to use data to change systems, um, because I often find that, uh, unfortunately, the loss of those lives um, sometimes isn't enough for policymakers and for decision makers uh, or executive directors to really be able to make the change that needs to happen. Um, it gets brushed off or it gets put aside or there's 
um, any number of reasons um, that are given for why that data can't be paid attention to. Um, and, and so for me, data serves as a pathway for being able to uh, really put things straightforward um, and say, hey, look, um, when we look at this, why are things this way? And what can we do better? And how do we create the change uh, that's needed? Um, and at the same time, for me, e evaluation and research is not about me being able to say, look what I did, I created a cool project, here's a publication, let's put forth a paper. Um, it, it's a way to be able to find ways to elevate the voices of others um, and to be able to ensure that we have equitable representation so that we can change that. Um, and, and so to me, evaluation and, and research hopefully is never something I by myself am doing, um, but is rather a collaborative effort where uh, we're taking those stories and we're taking those experiences and we're bringing people to the table in authentic and meaningful ways and we're finding ways to elevate those voices um, so that when those issues, when those topics are brought to uh, the table, they can't be ignored uh, because the data shows us and the methodology is there and we have uh, rigor and all these other standards and things that um, we've been told, hey, you have to have these things in place in order for it to be listened to. Um, and so we can bring all of those things to the table and we can find ways to uh, really elevate those experiences and for those voices and those stories to not be missed. Um, because otherwise, I, I think we continue to uh, marginalize and we continue to oppress and we continue to tokenize those experiences. And, and the result is uh, not only damaging, but it's fatal. Um, and so we have to find ways to do better in what we call research methods. And, and I, you know, if we had more time, we could go through uh, the history of research and evaluation, and we could find exactly what uh, my panelists have, have said, uh, which is that research and evaluation, though it holds so much potential and so much power, um, has often been used and disguised in ways to do a lot of harm. Um, and you could find that in the history of uh, studies and experiments and practices, um, entire fields. Um, you know, if you went, I, I don't know that this is what you would naturally think we discuss on a behavioral health uh, webinar, but if you went to back to the, the history of gynecology, you would find uh, damage that had been used within uh, research studies and disparities there. Even. Um, and so we've got to find ways to uh, elevate voices. And I think data for me is one of those pathways for me to be able to step back and be able to use my privilege to try to elevate the voices of others. That was also beautifully said by everybody. Thank you so much for sharing those pieces of your journey and the motivators for what brought you towards this work. And I have no doubt that that's resonating with others in the room, so thank you. And moving on, I am very curious what you would all suggest in terms of education or certifications or special training, education-wise, what would you all have to offer for somebody who might be interested in a career in research? Rochelle, I don't wanna call you out on this one, but I really liked what you had to say in our prep session. So if you don't mind, if I start with you. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you're going to have to remind me. What <laughs> Just session. your interesting perspective on where we're at in terms of a PhD within this oh, field. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, it's interesting because I, as I mentioned, I direct this initiative that's around supporting kind of the diversity of the field um, and thinking about different pathways into research and evaluation. And oftentimes we tend to prioritize or emphasize um, you know, professional degrees and, and oftentimes the PhD is kind of held as the gold standard for, for getting into the field and interest. I mean, I talk to a lot of students and young people and really try to understand like, well, what is it that you're really trying to achieve here? And is the PhD really necessary? <laughs> because oftentimes it's not. And sometimes you get over overeducated in some ways that sometimes price can price people out of careers that they're interested in because of the kind of work that you're wanting to do. And so, for example, for, for students that are really interested in clinical work, I'm often not suggesting PhDs at this point because most 
um, agencies or organizations are looking for um, master's level um, professionals. And so when you get your PhD, you're kind of sometimes um, moving yourself out of a position or an opportunity. And so I, I just encourage young people to think about like, and like having the degree, if that's the route you wanna go, kind of match the career that you're looking at. And then the other thing I'll offer is that, you know, we're really putting a lot more emphasis on lived experience for our hiring too. We don't require a change matrix and many other organizations don't require the advanced degrees because we'd like to recognize and honor that people come in with a lot of different kinds of lived experience. And it could be experience that you get on a job or through an internship or through a certification program um, that is different. And so we, we recognize that and, and also note that for many students of color too, that there are such barriers to achieving advanced degrees that we don't wanna kind of perpetuate that in the way that we think about pathways um, to different different career opportunities. So, so that, Annie, I hope was what I shared. <laughs> and I'll, I'll um, pass over to anyone else who would like to mm -hmm. add in too. <laughs> yeah, I think that was really well said and important. Um, and I feel like, you know, with the idea of being able to recruit more people from lived experiences from the communities um, about whom decisions are made and policies are made, um, I also feel like sometimes, um, you know, higher degrees and the highest degrees is a real barrier. I mean, there are so many equity issues who, you know, those of us who have gone through all of that, um, all of that training, um, who, uh, who can sort of delay having a living wage, honestly, it's like a, you know, it's a genteel poverty <laughs> to, to, to do a PhD, who can, who can delay having a living wage and being able to support your family for all those number of years. Um, so in some ways, it's no surprise sort of, you know, who are the people with PhDs um, and how come not more people are able to earn them. But I think that the main point that Rochelle was making is uh, that maybe you don't need that highest level of degree and um, in many cases, uh, there, there are other ways to communicate, uh, to, to participate in research, um, especially sort of some of the research models that are community-based, participatory um, action research that really centers lived experience. Um, and you don't need the highest level of training, um, you know, to be a researcher in all cases. <laughs> and for our next question, um... I'm curious to any professional opportunities for development that present themselves within your position. Um, how do you feel like the pay is comparatively speaking? How do you feel like your benefits are? Um, just for those who might be wondering about those real financial or, or growth considerations for a field like this. Do you feel like that's about on par any better or any worse from, you know, maybe another field in psychology, a position in psychology? I'll take a stab at this, um, but I'm looking forward to hearing from my fellow panelists, I think, on this as well. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity for um, what this looks like. And I think, again, one of the things that sticks out to me is like others, I, I think I was told, you know, if you really want to do research, PhD is the only way. Um, and I, I don't think that's true. Um, I think there are a lot of very, very, I mean, there's so many different pathways. I mean, you saw the list on some of the slides earlier about some of the different uh, careers within evaluation, within research. Um, I, I think for me, part of it just begins with the question of what are we doing to try to evaluate whether this is successful? Um, and so if you're meeting with your counselor, you're meeting with your caseworker, you have a mentor um, who is working within a social service field, you have a professor um, who you knew is doing some kind of uh, research or evaluation that maybe you have an interest in, um, I think it's fine just to ask, you know, what is it that you're doing to really show that this makes a difference? Or how do I know that our time worthwhile is really uh, going to be meaningful? Or how do I know that this is really making a difference? Um, and I often find that evaluation is sometimes given sort of the, it's sort of secondary um, to everything else. Services and other things sort of come first um, in, in some cases. Um, and I think evaluation really is one of those things that 
there's sometimes a desire to do, but there's not an awareness or an ability to know how to do it um, in light of everything else. And so I think part of it is just being able to ask that question of what is there that can be done to better assess this? And how are you getting feedback? Um, and when I say feedback, I don't mean, hey, I went to Taco Bell and I got a cool satisfaction survey that took me two minutes to complete because I could win free tacos for a year. Um, but I mean something that's more meaningful of, you know, what does it really look like for us to get community feedback? And to me, there's wins that we can easily present. It, it ultimately saves costs, it saves lives, it's more cost efficient, um, it improves outcomes, it increases uh, engagement, um, the list goes on and on. Um, and, and it doesn't even begin to touch the personal differences, I think, to make it makes to individuals when they know that they're voices have meaning that they can, are actually being used and listened to. Um, but, you know, when I think about that, I think just asking those questions and really trying to have those conversations. Um, I mean, I, I can think of professors who I started doing uh, research with, and it, it, it didn't feel like research, right? It felt like an opportunity to really try to understand was the program that I was in really effective. And if it wasn't, what was it? that was needed to be able to make a difference um, in that change. And so I think part of it to me just begins with a conversation. And I know that sounds simplistic maybe, but I, to me, the, the desire is often there. It's just not unknown. Um, where do we begin this? And, and sometimes I, I think even then there's an opportunity to walk into a position um, or there may be a, additional evaluation support, or there may be a need for someone who has that lived experience to be able to do interviews and talk with other people who uh, have that same lived experience as well, because the data that we get um, is better when people with lived experience talk with people with lived experience, um, and it's more accurate. <laughs> um, and so, um, I, yeah, I, I think those are some of my initial thoughts, um, but would love to pass it off to uh, some of my other panelists and see uh, what they think. The initial question about funding and compensation is an interesting one for me to answer as a present graduate student because um, it's tough. <laughs> it's rough. Um, if you are fortunate enough to be in a funded graduate program, either a, a master's or a fellowship funded graduate program or a PhD program that has funding, your stipend is, is not always livable and it's a challenging, um, it's a challenging sacrifice. And there's a privilege to being able to do that. Um, and oftentimes that is not a feasible uh, option. So it's definitely a consideration and builds off of the prior conversations about is, is the higher advanced degree necessary to do the thing that you want to do in the future? Because if not, there are other ways to do it that might be a more meaningful use of your time um, that don't cause you to sacrifice the well-being of yourself, your family, or the ability to put food on your table. Um, those are real considerations that I think every person looking to pursue a PhD, a master's program needs to consider. Yeah, thanks for sharing that perspective, because I think that's really important. When I when I went through grad school, I did have um, a fellowship that and a stipend and a, and a research assistant position that helped to um, support me through school. Um, but my my husband, my partner, um, did not. And, you know, I remember paying off debt. We paid, you know, loans off for a long time. I, I think that's just an important thing to consider um, as you're looking at different opportunities. Um, and so, you know, I guess one thing I'd share around, you know, the, the pay for this kind of position is that, you know, a lot of, and, and Pamela can talk to this probably a little bit more, but most federal agencies for a lot of their programs require an evaluation component uh, of programs. And so usually there's a set aside of like 10% or something like that for, for most, um, for many uh, federal opportunities. And so um, those kind of grants often go to either state agencies or community-based organizations. And so they're, you know, they're needing that kind of expertise and that support um, to help them, you know, meet their deliverables on a grant project. And so those are often, you know, th that is kind of one career path that many people take. And that was kind of listed on a previous slide. Um, another career path that I think researchers and evaluation um, evaluators often take is kind of, I, I'm talking about settings now at this point, so they could be in like a state agency, you could be working or partnering with a, um, 
with a nonprofit agency. And oftentimes those are nonprofits are recipients of different kinds of state or federal funding that also, again, requires some kind of um, component of evaluation or, or research or sometimes as an add-on. Um, so those are always good places to, to, to look, I think. And then, um, and, and then I also think too that Sometimes people, I, I never thought I would do this, but they go out on their own, right? Like I always kind of, you know, I grew up in an Asian family. It was like, you know, you go and you work for somebody or you're at a university um, or, or you're a doctor or a lawyer or something. And so, but, um, you know, I, I think that it might feel kind of, um, you know, scary or risky to go out on your own and start providing services, especially when you're early in your career. But there are plenty of consulting businesses to look at. You know, they often talk about kind of the beltway bandits that are in the DC metro area. But there are a lot of, um, you know, firms and agencies that focus really on research and evaluation. And I think getting to know some of those organizations, I can offer those, Annie, to the team to share, but there's some, you know, larger scale, scale national um, organizations that need people at entry level positions that are exploring this. So I think those are always also good opportunities to look for. And of course, universities, which David can talk to. But Pamela, I'll pass to you to see what you might add. Oh, sure. No, I think that those, that those are really helpful reminders of, you know, the, the kind of research opportunities that are available. And that's absolutely right about there being a research and evaluation component, a program evaluation component of many, many of our federal, um, federally funded opportunities, program opportunities. Um, so I, I would say a lot of those research opportunities are definitely in, in the more applied policy focused realm and kind of the stuff that I, that, you know, what I did when I was uh, training and my dissertation that is more sort of contributing to basic research. Um, and I, you know, there, there, I would say um, outside of university settings, probably those opportunities are going to be more limited to, to contribute to basic research. Um, about phenomena of interest, but um, you know, if you're in a university setting and you are a researcher, it is likely that you are in a position that also involves some teaching and other administrative responsibilities in addition to um, researching. And as a university-based researcher, not dissimilar to Rochelle um, and and David, right? I I mean, I'm also responsible for applying for lots of grants to fund my work, <laughs> um, and you know that is the case of of being in a more academic position. Um, there are some academic positions where all of your salary comes from <laughs> um, kind of applying for grants and the the work that you generate. Um, in getting those grants. And then there are some university settings where the university gives you a salary and your advancement depends on sort of how much of a research uh, program you can develop by applying for grants and getting them and having sort of a, a whole research agenda that you uh, implement, you know, that, that you, that unfolds over a number of years. But I mean, it's, I, I would say that, um, you know, it's, it's definitely kind of the, this kind of work that we're talking about is definitely different from being in the private sector or, you know, other, other careers in psychology and social work where you are, um, a pro, you know, a private practitioner, but there are also many sort many kind of clinical roles, which is, is going to be discussed in the next panel that are also in the public system where, um, you know, this, there, there'll be a big difference in salaries depending on um, the population served and the, the kind of organization that you're involved with, um, you know, that, that is providing the clinical services. And I'll just say, just on a personal note, um, similar to what Eden is saying, um, my husband also has a PhD and is a university-based researcher, and we had to take turns um, in graduate school because we couldn't afford with our family to both be in graduate school earning a PhD at the same time. So combined, it took our it took our family 11 years to earn those two degrees because I, I had to work um, while my husband was completing his and then it was the, the same, then, I, then it was my turn to complete it. And that's just how it worked out with whoever decided to pursue first. So, right, there are many sort of sacrifices that you make if, if that's what you wanna do. And I think that another, another issue is, um, 
just uh, Eden talked about funded programs. Um, Rochelle talked about this as a student. Um, I didn't always have funding for my graduate work. So I worked at the same time as even my husband was also working at the same time as studying. So it is a privilege <laughs> to be able to study. Um, and, um, you know, we understand that not everyone can take advantage of that. So, I mean, I think one of Annie's next questions is, is, is going to be about other ways to get that training aside from sort of formal academic training and being a full-time student. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that's a great segue um, for an individual who uh, has decided that they would like to pursue a career in research. I think that that kind of ties into what, what helpful resources might anybody have to suggest, kind of pathways to do this, things that, that could help was, you know, for example, finding a mentor instrumental for you? If you took a less traditional route, um, was that instrumental for you? What, was there ways of learning about opportunities or seeking out for academic support? Just any, any helpful things that, that maybe an individual might not have thought of as a way to further this career for themselves? I think that, uh, a preliminary question is what part of research and what kind of research are you looking to pursue? So speaking from my own experience, I'm more on the quantitative side, the statistical analysis side, the computer science programming side. And so I would encourage anyone who's interested in that sect of the research process to take advantage of the enormous amount of free access educational materials that are available online. If you want to learn a new programming language, if you want to learn how to pre-process data sets, there are massive uh, labeled data sets for you available to do that that often come stock and, and free open source statistical software. Um, there are video playlists and open source courseware, um, and that was instrumental for me as I was deciding and exploring this kind of side of the research environment, and I didn't need a formal academic institution to introduce me to these concepts, but having them before applying was very interesting um, and strengthened my application. So I would encourage folks to explore those options as well. I yeah, I, I, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, you know, please. No, I was saying I, I was going to popcorn to you, so it works out. <laughs> All righty, well, I appreciate it. Um, no, I completely agree with you, Eden. I, I think there's a lot of great resources out there. And I mean, there's even certificate programs. I mean, I, I can't speak to their quality because um, I've not taken them personally. But I mean, I know Google, for example, offers a uh, certificate in data analytics. Um, and so there, there's a lot of similar things. Coursera, um, I, I think Harvard has uh, some online things through uh, some of their uh, programs. Um, and so there's so many different things that are available and they're free to access. Um, and so, I mean, to me, again, when it comes down to, do you need a doctorate to do this? Um, I, again, I don't know that you do. There may be very specific cases where it's helpful um, and I'm appreciative for the education, but I think there's other ways that you can do this and still be just as um, effective in the work that you're doing, and maybe even more so because, I, again, I, and I don't remember who it was that mentioned it, but I mean, I, I do think that there's a point in which sort of an over-professionalization can try to take place of that lived experience, and it's that lived experience that really, I think, allows for you to be um, effective in so many of these roles because it, it changes how you uh, view that research, and it changes how you view the data, and it changes how you think about um, what interpretation looks like and how you interpret that data as well. And so, um, yeah, I would absolutely say take advantage of any of those free resources that you can. Um, and again, you don't have to be a master in all of these things, right? Like it, you, I, I, I know very little uh, about programming languages, which is why I'm appreciative for people like Edith. Um, I appreciate the theory behind um, statistics, but the math portion of it outside of those programs um, I struggle with. <laughs> um, and I appreciate um, the opportunity to be able to uh, get to some of that. And so for me, just the opportunity to be able to think through those different pathways. And what is it that I really want to do? Um, because if I want to collect data and I want to listen to those stories, and that's a different role than if I want to sit down at a computer and I want to look at numbers all day. 
Um, and, or if I want to try to look at the data and try to transcribe that and code that all day, um, or if I want to tr transcribe data. Um, and, and so, I mean, even that, I think just transcribing data, there are roles out there that if you're decent at typing, um, there are absolutely roles out there in companies that will transcribe data um, on a regular basis. And maybe part of your way into getting into research is really just being able to uh, take those interviews and being able to kind of type those out for uh, those researchers and then being able to ask questions more about what it is that they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, so I think part of it is trying to look through across, across that entire spectrum of options and really being able to kind of decide, you know, of these different roles, what is there that I really want to do? Um, and finding something that matches my interest, but also find something that matches your talent. Because again, I, I love being able to dabble in computer language and statistics and other things, um, but they become sort of secondary for where more of the skill and the value that I bring is, but also some of the interest that I feel like I bring is. I mean, ditto to what everyone has said. I, I'm probably more of a qualitative person too. So um, I, I I agree with the kind of figuring out what, what gives you joy, what gives you passion and energy in, in the work that you do. And and it may be that then, yeah. then you can figure out like, oh, what's the role or what's the component in research um, or evaluation work that that's kind of best match with. Everyone on our team always takes a strength finder test, which I just love because it allows us to look across our whole team and see kind of like where everyone has different strengths. And, you know, I'll just share that one of my, my top five was like, both strategic thinking as well as kind of being the continuous learner. And it just kind of matches up like, oh yeah, and that's why I like doing this kind of work because those are skill sets that I can bring into it, but I don't bring in some other kind of, uh, some other pieces of it or technical um, aspects of the work. Like David said, I mean, I used to love SPSS programming, but now I could not do that to save my life, right? And so, and that as you move on, as you kind of progress in your professional career too, um, there are different things that you lend your, your thought partnership to in a process, right? Not everyone has to do all the same stuff. So um, I think kind of taking, I love taking assessments and like figuring out those kind of like where those strengths are, what my personality type is and like how that then matches up with what a career choice might be for myself. And I think as you saw in an earlier slide, there's so many different aspects to research that, that you can plug into. Yeah. I know we have to move on and we're excited to um, hear your questions for us, but I just wanted to say, I, I really love what Rochelle just said about um, ways to lend your thought, thought partnership. Um, and right, I, 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 all those years in government, I worked, I'm a qualitative researcher, I worked right beside economists and we figured out how to put the numbers that are very compelling to um, policymakers together with stories that kind of lends it some kind of lends it more of a human edge, I'd like to say, and kind of can um, be a way to bring um, the voices of the people we serve into, into the story of, of how policy is made. So I mean, I think that there are, and I think we had, there was a good um, comment by Tim about kind of state policy work being a really good choice for folks and maybe um, kind of the opportunities available for bachelor's level folks in, um, in state positions. So I think that was also a really good call. And I feel like that is also very similar, uh, closer, closer to communities, but similar to the kind of federal work that I was engaged with and the kinds of opportunities, um, you know, to partner with colleagues across methods that will be available kind of to both David and Rochelle, two things that stuck out to me. And if they stick out to me, they might to somebody else. But Rochelle, I think another thing from our planning call was um, just how invaluable a resource that a college professor can be um, just as an opportunity to find information, opportunities. Would you mind just expanding on that slightly? And then David, afterwards, if you wouldn't mind just speaking slightly more to the misconception that you might have to be a math genius for a position like this. And 
you know, different ways that someone might be able to get around that. So Rochelle. Sure. Thank you, Annie. And so uh, I shared briefly a little bit about my experience with um, having a mentor as an undergraduate student. And really the way that happened was because I was taking a class with him and just happened, just approached him um, afterwards and asked him if he had any opportunities um, that an undergraduate student could uh, take part in. And, and he did, which was awesome. And so that's, that was like one of my first jobs in college was to do research with him in his sleep lab. And, you know, I, I have a son who is a junior in college now too. And you know, I share that story with him. I keep on encouraging him because he's currently looking for internships and having a hard time. And I, keep, I kept on saying, it's all about the relationships. Koi, you've got to just reach out, like get over, like being concerned about talking to a professor outside of your class. And so, you know, he finally did reach out to one of his chem lab instructors and, you know, and, and engaged in a really helpful conversation and, and got to hear about some other opportunities that are there. It didn't turn out to be a job and though that's okay, right? It's just the taking the first step, you know, um, making the connections and creating the relationships, I think are really important as as, as you're early in career and trying to figure out um, paths forward because you never know where a conversation is gonna lead you. And so just encourage you to kind of think about um, uh, professors as well as you know, other, other kind of networks that you have um, and you never know where it's gonna to lead. So that was my experience and I'll pass it over to David. Yeah, no, thank you so much for sharing, Michelle. Um, you know, again, I, I don't think that you have to be great at math. Math Being math, good at math probably helps. Um, but is it something that is a necessity? Probably not. Um, I thought I was really good at math when I lived in Georgia and went to Georgia public schools. Um, we moved to a small West Texas town that was pretty high academically um, and uh, was 120 pages ahead of the math book. Um, and I realized maybe I wasn't good at, as good as I thought I was. Um, so I, I never took calculus. I never took trig. Um, in high school, I never took statistics. The highest that math I took was uh, algebra two, and I made a case for why I didn't need other math at that time, um, and somehow it was listened to. Um, and, and so uh, going into college, I, even then, I never really planned on taking another math course. Um, and statistics was one of those things that I ended up taking in order to go to grad school. Um, and I, I found an appreciation for it. Um, it. But outside of that, math is not necessarily the thing that I love most. Um, I, again, I think there's a perception sometimes that says you have to know how to calculate t-tests and variance scores and um, all, all these other types of uh, regression models. And if you can do this by hand, you really need to be able to do that. The nice thing is, and others have mentioned SPSS, there's so many free softwares as well, uh, R and um, quite a few others um, that exist that are free to access. And they're going to run a lot of those numbers for you. Now, it's important that you understand why those numbers are being run and the way that they're being run, what they mean, um, and what to do with them. Um, but again, I put a resource in chat. Uh, Laird for me is a lifesaver at points because it um, is a small cost service that you can go to and it provides all that information about, well, why would you run a t-test in this case? What does that look like? What do I do with that information? How do I write out the results in a way uh, that make actual sense? Um, and then make friends with statisticians if you can. Um, sometimes I feel like it's hard to know who's a statistician and it's hard to think of maybe working with someone who um, is that mathematically inclined. Um, but if you can meet a statistician, or you can meet someone who at least has an understanding of uh, some of those numbers, that's great. Um, and then just keeping in mind, I think at the same time, that quantitative research is really a very small part of the overall research landscape. Um, you've got so many uh, ethnographies and survey methods and data collection methods. and the things that we call research, some uh, research, I think sometimes are really kind of limited. Um, there, I mean, I, 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 I love podcasts, right? I love things like Radio Lab, um, and Radio Lab, in some ways, is just as much research um, as it is otherwise. That there's opportunities to really be able to gather information and stories and listen to people, um, and so you know, when thinking about that breadth of what it looks like to do research and evaluation. 
Um, there's absolutely a need for people who are great at numbers and who love numbers and want to be able to run that stuff and understand um, why it works a certain way to be able to run percent changes um, with three different formulas instead of only using one. Um, if you're that person who wants to do that, that's awesome. Um, but if you're not great at numbers or that's just not your passion, um, find ways to do um, computer software um, and computer programming and, and those other options that are available there because there's absolutely a space and a need for uh, people in research and evaluation who maybe aren't great at math, but who have that lived experience and who are passionate about being able to make the difference that research can bring. All right, great. Thank you, Annie, so much. And thank you so much um, from the bottom of our hearts to our wonderful expert panelists today, David, Eden, Rochelle, and Pamela. You all are just fantastic. And it's been really just enlightening to hear your personal stories and how you got into this field. So thank you very much. Um, on the behalf of NTAC um, for participating today. We appreciate it so much. Um, as mentioned earlier, we are compiling a resource guide that will be sent out at, at the conclusion of all four uh, Career Pathways series uh, at the end of July. We are also hosting a mental health clinicians panel. I had dropped the link to register for that um, into the chat. Um, with also a survey for today's session for feedback. Um, so please thank you all very much for attending and we hope to see you in July for the mental health clinicians panel. And again, thank you to all of our panelists and Annie, thank you so much for your wonderful facilitation today. Um, so everyone enjoy your day and take care.